فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم عقبة بن عامر عقبة بن عامر Uqba ibn Adam, may Allah be pleased with him, reported the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to me, Not a single night should pass without you reciting Surah al-Ikhlas and the Mu'adithin, and so I never let a night pass without reciting them. Look at that. The Prophet said to him, Uqba, O oh, Uqba, don't let a night go by without you reading Qul huwa Allahu ahad and the Mu'awwidatayn. And insha'Allah ta'ala, when I start the tafsir of the Quran, we're going to take many benefits that are in the Mu'awwidatayn. Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah wrote a thick book on just the Mu'awwidatayn and the benefits that are in it. Ibn Taymiyyah. Many of us don't even know what in these two surahs. Qul a'udhu falak and qul nas. The benefits that are in them is amazing, wallahi al-azim. And how Allah protects you. When the Prophet ﷺ got magic done on him, what did he read? Huh? Ya ikhwah. Many of us already have the cures, right? Many of us already have cures, and, and, and but who, how many of us actually go and read it? Now, mm -hmm. so he never left it. Uqba said, "I never ever left it. Never." He says, "فَمَا أَتَتْ عَلَيَّ لَيْلَةٌ إِلَّا وَأَنَا أَقْرَأُهُنَّ." Never came a night except I read it. They even asked him on your deathbed. He said, "Yes, even my deathbed, I read it that day. That night, I was on his deathbed before he died." He read it. Ibrahim and Nikhai also stated they used to recommend that the three chapters of Ikhlas and the Mu'adatayn be recited three times. This is an authentic hadith in accordance to the conditions set by Muslim. It is also reported that Ibrahim and Nikhai said that they used to teach them to recite the Mu'adatayn whenever they went to bed. So when you go into bed, sit in your bed and do this. Read it and read each of them three times. Naam. Uh, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, once said the Prophet وسلم, would not go to bed until he had recited Surah Al Zumar and Al Isra, Al Timridi, Al Timmili, narrated this hadith and classified it as Hassan section. It is recommended that one recite the ending of the Ali Imran upon waking up at night, starting from Verily, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, that's ayah 190, until the end of the chapter. This is due to the fact that it is narrated in two authentic books that the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, would recite the last portion of Surah Al Ali Imran whenever he woke up. So, in the Fihalki Samawati, the Ardu Wahtilafi, Layli, and Nahari, these verses from onwards, the Prophet, as soon as he woke up, he would make that, he would recite it. He would read it to the ending of Surah Al Imran when you wake up, reading it. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, try this. That day you will wake up and you fresh. At night you read, you slept and you read your Quran. In the morning you woke up and you read your Quran. Are you there? I promise you, you feel fresh. Even if the person wakes up, and when they wake up, slowly, they say, Alhamdulillah, alladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushur. When they wake up, I promise you that day is so fruitful. Imagine the person who adds on to this, these surahs in the Quran. Section regarding what to recite when with, when with a sick person. So if a person is sick and he's ill, what, do you should, what should you do to them? Now, again, what Quran should we read to our ill parents, family members, cousins? How should we cure their situation? This is what you need to do. It is re recommended that al fatiha be recited due to the Prophet وسلم, saying in an authentic regarding in an authentic hadith regarding this chapter. And how did you know that it was treatment? So read Surah Al Fatiha. If you go to visit a sick person, sit at that sick person's head and read Surah Al Fatiha seven times. Seven times. You go to your cousin or you hear your auntie sick. Your mom says, Oh today I feel tired, I'm sick. Sit her, tell her to sit down, lie down, and read Surah Al Fatiha on her seven times. I promise you, it's a cure. Now, 
It is also recommended that one recite al ikhlas al falaq and an nas and then blow it onto one's palms after having done so. So again, what you can do is to read Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad, Qul A'udhu Bil Falaq, Qul A'udhu Bil Nas, blow it into your two hands and then wipe it over the person. If the person is not a mahram, then of course you don't touch them, nor do you go close to them. Can a woman read on a man that's not her mahram? Of course she can. She can, she can read on him. She can read on her cousin if he's sick, for example, but it's better to avoid it. This is an authentically narrated practice of the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, and it is reported in the two authentic books. This is, this is also something that has already been explained in the previous chapter. Talha ibn Musarrif reported, it was stated to me that if the Qur'an is recited upon a sick person, it relieves and revitalizes him. And so I once entered upon Khaythama when he was sick. I said to him, I see you smiling today. He replied, indeed, the Qur'an was recited upon me. So here is an issue which is if a person is sick, he said, If a person is sick and you read the Quran right next to them, they find they, they find themselves a bit light. Are you with me, brothers? So try to read. Nowadays, alhamdulillah, because you can't every day get somebody to read for you, alhamdulillah, we've got recorders, we've got tapes, we've got video. Try to sleep at night listening to somebody. It's so nice. Who, how, how many of you go see listening to Quran? Who else? Huh? Some people say like when you pay a Quran before you sleep is not good because you have to pay attention to the words. And also some people say, which uh, I think is not here, that the best rupiah is the one you're doing yourself. But even this is not rupiah, like uh, you uh, I, I don't know where I had it, I don't know if it's authentic or not, but it's not good to um, play. The issue of whether the, whether the recording can be a ruqya, that's a different thing. That's a whole different thing. You're not listening to the Quran to cure yourself. You see. So the issue of cure, there's a khilaf. There's a khilaf whether it can be used as a ruqya. There's some scholars who hold the opinion that it's not permissible, that the tapes and the audios are not ruqya. What is ruqya is that the person comes and he reads on you. Some scholars, they say, no, it's permissible to listen to it. The point we're talking about here is not the ruqya. We're talking about listening to Qur'an before you go to sleep. If, of course, you've got a family member who's reading Qur'an, like your wife is reading the Qur'an, you go, okay, try it, just read it next to me then. And you go to sleep listening to it, that's good. Or he's, your husband is reading, and she just listens to his recitation, and she, she goes to sleep. That's, that's better, much better. Or your brother and sister. Or your brothers. Your brother hearing your station, all of that. Or your mum. That's good. If you don't have it, I think you should listen to Quran and sleep. So the idea is posting of, um, not, uh, of uh, saying people saying you can't listen to Quran and sleep. No, okay. that's incorrect. You can listen to it. Rather, I realized that the, the night I go to sleep listening to Quran personally, that whole night, subhanAllah, is, is somehow connected to the Quran that I listen to. When I wake up, I can still remember those verses in my head. The night, sometimes I go to sleep listening to what? Lectures. Majority of times I go to sleep listening to lectures. Or listening to, uh, uh, I've been reading so much, I got tired, I just can't be, I can't do it anymore, my brain is gone, it's, it's freeze. But I still want to benefit. So I just put on a tape or I put on a cassette or Sheikh Albani, Mathalan, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, Sheikh Ibn Baz, other ulama mashayikh, I'll listen to them. When I wake up, akhi, it's like, it's somehow I feel like I've been listening to all of it going through my head. Has it happened that you went to sleep and the Quran was still on? No, you generally switch it off in it, right? Before you sleep. Yes or no? Majority of times you would switch it off. Yeah? Sah? The majority of the times you're going to switch off. It, you're going to somehow wake up and just switch off and go back to sleep. Okay, you're an exception, Gulid. <laughs> Gulid, you're an exception of the principle. What about you, outside? It switches off itself. 
He doesn't. <laughs> okay. What about you? You switch off. What about you? You don't even know what happens. <laughs> you look like a professor. You see, like a professor. What's your situation? What's your story like? You don't even listen to the Quran. And then you wake up and it's still on. It runs out of the battery, dies. And, and, and okay, the whole Quran, good. Are you going to be sleeping and the Quran is still on? For Fajr. And the and Quran is still on. Yeah, I can't do that. I can't do that. When I reach the point where I, my brain is tired and I'm going to sleep, I'm going to go to sleep, I just, me generally, I use the laptop in it. So the laptop is very, because it's, it's bright in it, so I make the like, light dark. I put the laptop down like that, and I listen, 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 listen. And when, I'm, when I feel like, okay, yeah, 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 Sheikh, you've hit too much notes. <laughs> you got to the point, I just, I close the laptop. Khalas. No, it's rare, rare. That I'd actually just let it just go on. Rare, rare. It happens sometimes. Now you're tired, you're very tired, it will happen. The overwhelming majority of the times, I switch off. Uh, no, it's not bad. No, Quran to be on. What's haram is for you to talk over the Quran. Are you doing anything over it? No, no. The Quran goes over your, it goes to your mind. Trust me, trust me. It's sublimatory messages. Ya akhi, wallahi, I tell my wives, put the Quran on 24-7 hours. Leave it on. You don't know these kids that are running around. You think they're playing. You think these kids are playing? Yahfaduna. They memorize everything that's been read. You trust me. It will go too much into your ear and you'll memorize it. This goes to the long term memory. Long term memory. Let's just let me give you guys an example. How much of you guys have memorized music that you didn't even intend to memorize? It just went to your brain. That's it. You don't need to answer it. Keep it to yourselves. Some of you are looking like, yeah, bro, it's true, it's true. I want you to say it out loud, it's true. Yeah, I used to know. We don't want you to expose yourself. Sah? So, that's the same with the Quran. It sticks to your brain. No. Al Khatib Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, may Allah have mercy on him, narrated with his chain of narrators that whenever Al Ramadi fell ill, he would say, Bring me the people of Hadith. And once they came to him, he would say, Read a Hadith upon me. Hence, if Hadith can be used in such instances, the Quran is all the more worthy of being used. Some of the Salaf, they used to listen to Hadith. They would just say, okay, can you narrate hadith for me? And they'll find joy from that. And that would cause them to be energized. If that's hadith, he says, Nawi, Fahada fil hadith, that's the hadith of the Prophet. Fal Quran al Kareem awla. The Quran is more befitting, right? Naam. So that means that shows the permissibility of listening to lectures at night when you want to go to sleep and the Quran and stuff like that. Section regarding what should be recited upon the dead. The scholars among So this whole chapter, we can just jump it based on the points that there's no evidence that's authentic transmitted in it. So all of that which he's gonna mention is weak. None of it's authentic. There's nothing that should be read on the dead. Nothing should be read on the dead. No hadiths, no evidences. But some scholars they said it is permissible to read next to are you with me? the one on his, who's on his deathbed next to him and the reason why they're reading next to him is so that he dies quickly that you know the nafs goes out easily and that he's, he, he doesn't go through the agony of pain the agony of death just that everything goes smoothly so this concept of this person is dead let's read Quran on him who, who, how many family members know, know that people who practice this reading Quran on the dead yeah is it very common in the Asian community yeah one just each and sadly who, 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 who pays for all of that the family who lost her they just lost a loved one they're suffering and then they have to go out of their way to buy food and feed others 
Look how much shaitan has fooled them. Are you with me? For them to be given money and for them to be given food and for them to be helped, that's what should have been happening. But what's happening is that they are getting, they're losing money and wealth and everything. Now. Yes, it's the words of Allah, but it should be said in the right places, right? The words of Allah. Can you read it in the toilet and just scream it all out? They'll say no to you. Same place in Allah to read it here. Yeah. Would you get a sin for it? Or would you of course you get a sin for it. You're, you're innovating. You're going to get sin for it now. Yeah. Just after they put the body into the ground, they put dirt on it. Yeah. Inna lillahi, yeah, that's true. It's innovation, all of that is weak. Somalis, they have this concept called, um, Somali have this very concept called, whenever they come to a gathering, hayyeh, they'll say hayyeh, hayyeh, um, fatiha, 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 fatiha. Meaning everybody just throw your fatiha in there. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. That's before the lecture, before the discussion starts. Have you heard that before? Gulid? You have? Hey, who else is Somali here? Allah, you guys are going to say, I ain't Somali, you are. You're Somali, right? Okay, okay. A lot of Somalis, they say they're Jamaican. <laughs> so, that's very common. In the early 90s, guess what happened? A lot of Somalis were in school and they were like, we're Jamaicans, we're Jamaicans, we're Jamaicans, we're Jamaicans. And in school, one time, all the Somalis started being honest, saying, yeah, I'm Somali, I'm Somali. And then I remember one of my teachers said, wow, wow. There's a lot of, a lot of you Somalis in the school. We're like, yeah. Like, wow, when did you guys all come here? We were like, what, well, 90% of them were already Somalis before they just say they're Jamaicans. They're old. So, anyways, the point is have you heard it before? They say Fatiha. Another thing that Somalis practice is that when they move into a house, what do they do? Read Quran on the? They read on the house, Quran. Sah? And they invite everybody over to eat and munch. Somalis do that. Asians do that as well? Yeah, they do Adhan on the house and they read Quran on the house, everything. Where is the Dili for Who said do it for a house? No, in the house. Huh? Who said when you move into a house? That's all innovation. Restricting it to a house, a day, everybody comes, Adhan is made, the shaitan is going to run away. Has a bid'ah, ma anzal Allahu biha. مَنْ أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ بِهَا مِنْ السُلْطَانِ مَنْ عَمِلَ عَمَلَ لَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُنَا It applies there. It's an innovation, newly invented matter. Yeah. How did it become between the Quran and the Salah and the Death? Yeah. How did it become between the Quran and the Salah and the Death? They use a hadith of the, can you, can you fast for your mother? What about Hajj for the dead? That, what's, what's the what's the what's the illa for Hajj? For the day, that's how they said. All righteous deeds reach them. That's what they said. Is it a strong opinion? That's a discussion that's open. But some scholars hold that opinion that the, the, all these actions they reach the dead. Some scholars said that. Um, some said the Quran doesn't reach them. Where did that come from? But they said this is Amal Salih, this is an Amal Salih, all of Amal Salih are reaching. What about a righteous child? His good deeds go towards his parents as well, right? All of that. So let's just, this chapter is weak, so let's not, move, let's not read that. We're going to go into the last chapter of the book, inshallah. We're going to finish today, inshallah ta'ala. اعلم ان القران فص الباب التاسع في كتابه القران واكرام المصحف اعلم ان القران العزيز كان مؤلفا في زمن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم على ما هو عليه في المصحف اليوم ولكن لم يكن مجموعا في مصحف بل كان محفوظا في في صدور الرجال وكان طوائف من الصحابه يحفظونه كله وطوائف يحفظون ابعاضا وطوائف يحفظون ابعاضا منه فلما كان زمن أبي بكر الصديق رضي الله عنه وقتل كثير من حملة القرآن خاف موتاهم 
واختلاف من بعدهم فيه فاستشار الصحابة رضي الله عنهم في جميعه في مصحف فأشاروا بذلك فكتبوا في مصحف وجعل في بيت حفصة أم المؤمنين رضي الله عنها فلما كان زمن عثمان رضي الله عنه وانتشر وانتشر الإسلام خاف عثمان رضي الله عنه وقوع الاختلاف المؤدي إلى ترك شيء من القرآن أو الزيادة في شيء فنسخ من ذلك المجموع الذي عند حفصة رضي الله عنها الذي أجمعت الصحابة عليه مصاحف وبعث بها إلى البلدان وأمر بإئتلاف ما خالفا وكان فعله هذا باتفاق منه ومن علي بن أبي طالب وسائر الصحابة وغيرهم رضي الله عنهم وسائر الصحابة رضي الله عنهم وغير وسائر الصحابة وغيرهم رضي الله عنهم وإنما لم يجمعه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في مصحف واحد لما كان يتوقع من الزيادة ونقص بعض المتلو ولم يزل ذلك ولم يزل ذلك التوقع إلى وفاته صلى الله عليه وسلم فلما أمن أبو بكر وسائر الصح سائر الصحابة رضي الله عنهم ذلك التوقع واقتضت المصلحة جمعه فعلو فعلوه رضي الله عنه واختلف في عدد المصاحف التي بعث بها فقد قال الإمام أبو عمرو الداني أكثر العلماء على أن عثمان رضي الله عنه كتب أربع نسخ فبعث إلى البصرة أحداهن وإلى الكوفة الأخرى وإلى الشام أخرى واحتبس عنده أخرى وقال أبو حاتب السجستاني كتب عثمان رضي الله عنه سبعة مصاحف بعث واحدا إلى مكة وآخر إلى الشام وآخر إلى الشام وآخر إلى اليمن وآخر إلى البحرين وآخر إلى البصرة وآخر إلى الكوفة وحبس بالمدينة واحدا وهذا مختصر ما يتعلق بأول جمع المصحف وفي أحاديث كثيرة في الصحيح وفي المصحف وفي المصحف وفي المصحف ثلاث لغات ضم الميم وكسرها وفتحها فالضم والكسر مشهورتان والفتح ذكر أبو جعفر النحاس وغيره نعم It is important that one understands that the Quran that the Quran the Quran compiles during the time of the Prophet وسلم, is exactly what exists in the Mus'haf today. At the time, however, it wasn't compiled in a single Mus'haf, but was instead preserved in the hearts of men. Among the companions were those who had memorized the entire Quran, while others had memorized parts of it. The Quran that we have today at the time of the Prophet sallallahu it was not, it wasn't compiled in the Mus'haf like it is today. No, not at all. But what happened was, the Sahabas memorized it from the Prophet. Some of the companions they memorized it all, and some memorized some of it. And remember, the Arabs were a, a nation of transmission. The Quran was about memorization and keeping it in the hearts. This concept of writing things came later. The Sahabas weren't, and the Arabs were not nation known for writing. They were known for memorization. And as you can see in the West today, the reason why they question the authenticity of the Quran is because they are a nation who give more importance to writing. Are you with me? And if you go now look at the East today, you find people memorizing. I remember seeing in, in Somalia a guy who memorized a dictionary. dictionary the English dictionary. He, he was, yeah. He actually had memorized the Oxford dictionary. I said, well, why do you need to do that? Why on earth do you have to memorize the dictionary for? So there are people, I'm guessing there's many like that in India. People who do that. Like, are you, are you with me? In the UK, when, when, when you speak to EE e. or Barclays Bank, who are you talking to? A person chilling in New Delhi. A call center in India. They've probably memorized the script. They're reading from the top of their head. They've got nothing in front of them. That's the type of people these people are, right? True or false? In England, the, the script is right in front of you. You read it, you wait for their answer, then you ask them the next question, and the script is right in front of you. You stick it in front of you, sah? These people memorize the whole question and answer session. Sah? They don't give that importance to that. So of course, they're going to compare everything based on how they are and the way that they see things. Now. Among the companions were those who had memorized the Quran, while others had memorized part of it. During the rule of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, many of those who had memorized the Quran were killed in the battle, so that he became concerned that those who had memorized the Quran would begin to disappear altogether. 
and that those who, had, who came after them would begin to disagree with regards to the Qur'an. He, therefore, consulted the companions with regards to compiling the Qur'an in a single mushaf, and they agreed that this was the best thing to do. The Qur'an was, hence written in a single mushaf and kept in the home of Hafsa, the mother of the believers. May Allah be pleased with them. When Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him, came to rule, Islam had become more widespread. So Abu Bakr, at his time, there came out the man, what's his name? Musaylama, Musaylama, who was a kathab, a liar, and he claimed prophecy, right? He did at the time of the Prophet So when Musaylama came, Musaylama, what did he do? He basically, him and, and Abu Bakr fought because there was a man who zakat and those who refused to pay the zakat and whatnot, and a lot of people died. A lot of, a lot of people died. And the people that died, were the, a lot of them were the Qurra, those who memorized the Qur'an. So Abu Bakr feared, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that the Qur'an will not be preserved. And that the people, sorry, not preserved, sorry, that the Qur'an will get lost. He got scared of that. So he hastened to making sure that the Qur'an is protected. Naam. So he consulted the companions in compiling the Qur'an in a mushaf, and they all agreed with him on that. So this was the first time it actually was written as a mushaf that was brought together. And then he placed that in the house of his daughter, uh, sorry, the, the daughter of Abu Umar, the house of Hafsa. Hafsa kept this cook. It stayed in her house. Now, when, um, when Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him, came to rule, Islam had become more widespread, which led Uthman to become worried that disagreements among Muslims might lead to something being deleted from the Quran or something being added to it. Uthman thus began to make copies of the Mushaf that he had kept with Hafsa and that had been agreed upon by the companions. He then distributed these copies across the Muslim lands and ordered that any conflicting copies be burned. This was an action upon which he, Ali ibn Abi Talib, the rest of the companions, peace be upon him, and others upon them all, and others agreed upon. The Prophet وسلم, did not compile the Quran. Somebody might say, okay, why didn't the Prophet do this? The Prophet didn't have to do this. The reason why the Prophet didn't have to do this is because the Prophet did not compile the Quran in a single Mus'haf during his lifetime owing to the assumption that something new might be revealed or that something of it might be abrogated and such anticipation was something that continued until he وسلم, died. 